everybody, Josh the RV Nerd here with the uh, International Committee of Nose Hairs uh, sometimes, as you viewers tend to point out. Um, no, more specifically, a vicious RV with your monthly-ish industry update. And I mentioned last week that there were some potential major shakeups happening. I actually had to edit chunks out of my last month industry update because things were evolving and changing so quickly. I know last month things were really vague. I'm going to try to give you some much more specific information this month on some brands that are maybe going away from the RV industry and what that could mean to you as a consumer uh, if you happen to find one of those that's still for sale out there right now. We've also got some other fun things related to like uh, towing safety and whatnot, but um, also something that only happens every 221 years, we are going to talk about Cicada Kid. That's right. Oh, yeah. All joking and nonsense aside, thank you for tuning in today. If you find these videos useful and helpful, uh, hit that like button if nothing else. Leave me a note that just says thanks, nerd. But as we go, please share your comments, thoughts, and experiences on things you've seen. And it's okay if you don't agree with me. If, if you have a completely diametrically opposed view on stuff, I'm not an authority. It's not my way or the highway. And I will uh, continue to chapter mark these videos to help you jump around uh, more specifically the topics that interest you. We're going to start with the used market and then flow through the new market and that flow will kind of make sense once we get going. So kicking things off, given a bit of a used market outlook, um, one of the only like real metrics I can track are like wholesale auction volumes from like, you know, major RV auctions around the nation. And, um, you know, a lot of this is tracked by like uh, Blue Book, Black black Book, one of those, one of those, one of those funny colored books. Anyway, um, they, uh, you know, I don't have insights into things like what you might see on Facebook Marketplace. This is, you know, going through professional uh, auction type organizations. And overall, the, the pricing of all used RVs is creeping downward. Now, I, I maintain, I will always probably feel this way until you prove me otherwise, that the values and costs of used RVs is really relative to new. Because why would you pay more for a used one if you could get a new one uh, for less with warranty? Um, the uh, the thing there is new RV prices have been creeping down, so it's putting pressures on the used market, and you're seeing those values go down. Uh, taking a look at the uh, towable market here, um, for the uh, it, it's been less volatile. You'll see that the motorized market suddenly become very uh, volatile in this uh, way. But for the fifth straight month in a row, we've seen a little bit of a slight decline. Now, interestingly uh, here. The average age of the used RV coming across these wholesale auction blocks is 2018. Now what that means is there's definitely some older stuff, but we are really starting to see the first uh, tr initial, I guess, signature or wave of the pandemic production era trailers trickling into the used RV market. We haven't seen a lot of that so far. Um, there have been uh, a few cases here or there like where somebody bought a 22 and wanted to flip out of it real quick, but not, not a great deal. And we're still on the first cusp of that, but a lot of it is coming through. So one thing I want to mention there, there's uh, a lot of uh, concern about pandemic pr uh, production era campers. And I've never denied that that, like, I've never said, oh, that's an invalid concern. Like, I've openly talked about that before. My recommendation when you're looking at something Frankly, I don't care where it, when it's built. I don't care if it's brand new today. I don't care if it's 10 years old or built during 2021 or whatever. Um, especially if you're a first timer. If you don't know what you don't know and you're looking uh, at something here and you have no clue about it and the only person you can talk to is the person uh, whose livelihood depends on you saying yes, it is not a terrible idea to get a second opinion, you know? Um, whether that comes in the form of a uh, independent third-party inspection, uh, if you have an, uh, you know, a friend, an uncle, a cousin, or someone who goes camping, just somebody to give you a second set of eyeballs on something to sniff it out, feel it out. I really feel that we're coming into a cycle where that would be a good idea. But I frankly always think that's a good idea. Um, flipping over here to the motorized market, giving you a look at the stats there, the motorized market values have been dropping like a rock. Uh, compared to um, last year, at the same time last year, uh, wholesale motorized used auction values is down like 15.6%. And uh, the, the ones that are selling are selling for about 15,000 less than the same time last year. Um, and the average age of those has gotten fairly young. And that's the thing that really kind of surprised me. Um, a lot of times when you see motorized values go down, Sometimes there's little waves where like a bunch of old motorhomes run through an auction block and it skews the numbers down. That's not happening. 
Uh, in the world of motorized RVs, an average age of 2015 is fairly young. That's about nine years old compared to the current model year. But uh, a lot of times the used motorized market hovers 12 to 13 years behind. So um, motorhomes are, are commanding less dollars and much newer models uh, commanding less, less dollars. So I think that you will definitely see that trend also trickle up and reflect through the, uh, the, the new RV motorized market as well. I think that you're going to see not all dealers, but a lot of dealers really shrink down in that inventory segment, uh, at least through, I, I'm gonna guess the, the first half of this year, if, if not longer. And then shifting over to the new RV market, I, I do wanna make a quick point to mention, by the way, all the stats, numbers, and charts that you're looking at here on screen today, all this stuff lags a couple months behind because it takes a little while for all the data collection to come in from all the sources that it comes in from and for like finance purchases to be finalized. So the only hard true numbers you have are usually about two months old, uh, typically. Anyway, um, looking at the, uh, the new RV market, looking at the rates of shipments, for the first time, I think in a year or longer, um, shipments uh, currently outpaced shipments last year, albeit by a small amount. But a lot of people were projecting that about December of last year is really when the industry uh, was kind of going to hit, I, I guess, the, the rockiest bottom it was going to hit for now. Who knows what happens in the future, but for now that's what we're looking at. And it's a small uptick, which means that dealers are being, I'm calling it smart stocky. They're really smartly ordering their inventory. And what you're going to see basically is a lot of inventories at a lot of places will be pretty much the greatest hits list that most manufacturers carry. Um, along the way though, um, if you look, the, the total 2023 shipments that were out there came in about half, a little over half, but about half of the best year ever in the RV industry, which was 2021, in which over 600,000 RVs were built and shipped to dealers within the uh, the 2021 calendar year, which no one in ever ever thought the industry would ever hit a pace like that. It was it was totally um, unprecedented. I'll be surprised if I ever see it again in my career. Frankly, who knows? But um. It, it, the thing is you look at that and it sounds awful you're like wow half wow everything must be just absolutely bottoming out and really what it is i've talked about it's a bit of a reckoning it's uh you know people are finally paying the piper right here um because there was you know huge surge in production and just to help put any product out there that manufacturers could we went through this phase where um duplicate sister clone product just became absolutely rampant far more so than the normal state of the RV industry. And that right there, as things shrink down, that is what's really fueling that, um, that consolidation from the manufacturers that I alluded to last month. So last month, some folks left comments, and I, and I think fairly that I kind of said a lot without saying very much. I, my goal with these videos is, like I've never said I, I, I know every single thing, is to try to give you ideas to put you as a consumer in a position to make the best, most educated decision possible. Well, um, sometimes that just means asking the questions like, what's happening with the brand of camper that I'm going to be buying? I was doing anything I could to give you all the advance notice I could. Now, what I'm about to do is list a bunch of brands that I've heard um, there may be some major shakeups and changes going on, but I need you to understand that this is not the kind of thing that RV manufacturers have uh, like put out in press releases. Um, this is stuff that just because I, I have a lot of contacts in the RV industry, I hear this stuff, and anything I'm sharing, I've only heard uh, specifically from reps at those companies. Like, if a guy from Forest River heard a thing about a Thor brand, I'm not really counting that on the list because it sounds like a little bit of potential poison water, you know? Um, and I 1,000% uh, I, I want to stress that this may not all be 100% correct. I do not want to hurt anybody with this information. I want to try to put you in a position where you know what questions to ask if you're getting read, uh, ready to spend a lot of money. So please keep in mind, this is completely subject to change. And uh, if you hear anything to the contrary, please leave comments and share with everybody because the goal is just to have the best information out there possible. I know that's two minutes without saying much. It's a big deal. Here we go. And I, I don't normally do this, but we, we've got a very specific list. I'm going with the RV Nerd Preferred Official Clipboard out here. By the way, life hack, if you leave the plastic on it from Walmart, it's now rainproof. Bam, follow me for more recipes. Anyway, 
Um, I'm about to go through a list of a bunch of RV names. Um, some of these are still in stock at some dealerships. They just, some of these may not be in production anymore after this. And you think, well, what will happen? What if I buy one of these? What about my warranty? We'll, we'll cover that all, uh, real quick. I just want to mention, like, don't freak out about it. It'll be okay. So kicking things off with our little adventure here, let's talk about Heartland RV. Um, I believe that Landmark may also be going that direction. And again, this is all, um, it, it may change in the future. And if it does, I will do everything I can to put out an update there because my goal is not to hurt you. These are companies we do business with, you know. I, I certainly don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to offend anybody. I, I just want to let you as consumers know what's going on. That's that relentless pursuit of transparency that we talk about. Um, the one that's kind of interesting here is um, Big Big Horn, not Big Country. Um, Big Horn, uh, they, they were very, very receptive to a lot of dealer input at the RV open house recently here. And what I kind of heard is that Big Horn's not going away. They are um, basically kind of taking her off. I think that they're going to go through like a full scale top to bottom Big Horn redesign to come out with something that's just a little bit more in tune with the current state of the RV market. And as weird as it sounds, sometimes you have to do an absolute hard break and reset rather than evolve on the fly. Um, that actually happened a couple years ago with Crossroads. Uh, Crossroads kind of did that where most of their products just quit being built for a while and now they're, they're back and they're healthy. So sometimes things like that uh, can happen a little bit. Um, now, a, uh, a Heartland subsidiary, Cruiser RV, uh, they're making a couple slight changes. It's kind of addition by subtraction. I, I, I think it was Radiance. If that's not correct, I'm sorry. I think Radiance is going to be retired. But um, they actually make three or four RVs that are very, very similar. But they had very small floor plan lists. They only had like six to eight floor plans. So I think what their goal here is to have fewer names, but to have a wider spread of floor plans available through their remaining brands. So they're not really shrinking down. Uh, they're, they're just focusing and bulking up in certain areas. Now, over at Forest River, um, that is one of those brands I, I heard a lot of different things. And again, this could be a moving target. It could change over time. Um, Forest River has done probably the best job of any major manufacturer of keeping themselves financially healthy. Some other manufacturers have really gotten themselves into hot soup. So I don't think the Forest River had to like really pull the pin and freak out about anything. Um, what I've heard is basically they're doing a lot of internal team restructuring. Uh, basically, we're like... Um, like Viking. Uh, so, you know, the Viking reps used to sell either the travel trailers or their little pop-ups. And now the reps are selling travel trailers and pop-ups and stuff like that, you know. How that relates to things that are consumer facing, things that you might see in long term, I don't know. And by the way, if the camera's a little jumpier and shakier than normal, I'm stomping through about 12 inches of snow and there's about two inches of ice under that right now. It's, uh, it's slickery dickery dock out here right now. <laughs> Now over to Palomino. Palomino is one of those brands that I heard a whole bunch of things. We're gonna do this, or, or, or they're, not we are, they're gonna do this and then they're not gonna do that. Like a bunch of things got kind of weird. What's interesting is that, you know, because Forest River owns a lot of different companies, you know, uh, Palomino, Primetime, all these different things. And it sounds kind of funny, but sometimes you'll have a division manager who manages a Forest River product as well as something else like a Palomino. And that was kind of a case of something that happened uh, recently here. Last month, all of a sudden out of nowhere, and some of you actually asked me about this, um, all of a sudden you heard about this thing called the Rockwood Luxury Fifth Wheel Series, like Rockwood River Ranch and Flagstaff uh, Elite, stuff like that. All of a sudden Rockwood and Flagstaff were coming out with this big high profile series of RVs. Well, it turns out what was actually happening is the Columbus product from Palomino was going to be renamed and reassigned under the, the Rock Staff Division of Forest River. And very quickly, that was undone and didn't happen. And I've noticed even on uh, the Palomino and Forest River websites, everything is basically back where it was. So my current understanding is that is not happening. Um, and I asked, you know, so are there some other changes or something we need to expect? And again, it was more just like personnel restructuring and not brand restructuring. So it doesn't sound like um, anything currently, you know, under the Palomino division is gonna go away. Although it did sound like that for a hot minute. Something I guess that should have technically fallen under the Heartland thing. And again, please ask for verification of this because it's going to very quickly sound like I'm attacking someone else. My understanding, uh, I, I've heard that uh, Mallard RVs, which are exclusive through Camping World, that um, they may be 
just ending their their run, their their call for those, as things like uh, Coleman have kind of you know come up and, and maybe take its place again. I get that that sounds like I'm attacking someone else. That's not my goal whatsoever. Uh, I just kind of want you folks to know what's going on there. I kind of heard the same rumor about Pioneer, which is also a Camping World exclusive. That would really shock me, though. I would not, I, I wouldn't think that would happen. I guess if it does, I'll let you know. Um, but their staff is probably in a much better position to be able to give you a, a final clarity on that. So if you're curious, give them a call. You know, I don't care. It's, it's all right. I'm just trying to put the info out there. But over to Dutchman. I just mentioned Colin. This is some. This is really interesting. So I've mentioned the uh, companies like Dutchman and Crossroads already uh, in this video. Um, they are actually subsidiaries of Keystone in the same way that like Starcraft um, and Highland Ridge or whatever are uh, subsidiaries of Jayco, if that makes sense. Um, the, uh, the the word is that Coleman is going to be reassigned under uh, Keystone. And it's not just a change in name, like the actual staff managing it, the production people eventually in time will be transitioning over, although that hasn't happened yet. Because it freaks some people out, uh, all of a sudden, beginning of January, a bunch of Dutchman employees working in those plants suddenly got Keystone logos on their paychecks, and they're like, what is going on? Am I going to keep my job? And, I, and, I, and again, I talked straight to Dutchman people on this who uh, said, hey, yep, I'll, I'll absolutely you know, let you know what's going on to the best of their ability. And uh, essentially... Coleman is being moved under Keystone. If I had to guess, that allows Keystone to say that they have the number one selling fifth wheel, Cougar, and the number one selling trailer, Coleman. Um, from a marketing standpoint, uh, it kind of makes a lot of sense to me too. Um, so that does mean that the product will probably change, but um, it won't like completely go away. Now, it's, it's not going to likely completely change since Dutchman is a Keystone subsidiary. They share a lot of DNA and engineering. So it might be more of a facelift than a complete redesign or something like that. Um, similarly, um, the, the Eddie Bauer uh, Camping World exclusive series is now being reassigned under Heartland. Now that's a very different division of Thor, so it's possible that will change a great deal. What it's going to look like or anything, I don't know, because I don't work uh, there, so I don't really have any insights into that kind of thing. Again, if you're curious, they can tell you, not me, more than likely. Um, the, uh, the, the thing is I asked, okay, so what about the rest of Dutchman? And my understanding is it will just be business as usual. And in fact, I've been told that they are considering launching two to three new brands, probably to take place of the, uh, the, the Coleman Eddie Bauer production that they did have before. But um, other than that, it sounds like they're just gonna keep on keeping on. And in terms of their sister cousin Crossroads, it sounds like they're just completely business as usual. I've heard absolutely no rumor mills swirling around them whatsoever. And as long as we're talking about Keystone, um, there were some rumors going around that uh, with a big volume, like, machine like Coleman coming under the Keystone banner and eventually that production moving to actual Keystone people and facilities that Keystone would be discontinuing some of their uh, other brands to kind of make room for that. It does not sound like that's the case. It sounds like everything that was a Keystone is going to continue being a Keystone. They're just adding the entire Coleman family under their belt over there. Now, all of that is way less violent and invasive than uh, I had originally heard. There were serious talks, uh, I guess, in some points of some entire branches, divisions of some of these companies, subsidiaries, whatever, going away. It doesn't sound like that's going to be the case. Um, what happens in the future? I don't know. I find out something else, I'll let you know. And once again, uh, these are things I've heard. These aren't like official press releases. I've got my ear to the ground, and I'm maybe a little bit ahead of the herd on this one. Um, if you were considering or looking at or you find one of those products i just mentioned at a store somewhere i would definitely you know investigate with those local folks i don't want you to go well josh said and then just like no i'm not doing business on that anymore that's not my goal here that's this has been a really scary segment for me i don't know if you've noticed i've been a little more keyed up than normal i get that i'm always like high energy and loud that's just the way that i am but uh, this is a scary kind of segment because if I get this wrong, I feel like I could hurt people. People who depend on the, the work to like feed their families. I don't want that to happen. I want you just to understand what you're looking at. Now, a big question with that. What about my warranty? What if you just bought one of those brands? What if you still find one new in stock somewhere? I'm, well, I'm pointing at a thing that's not uh, going away. But anyway, um, what if you find one new in stock at a store somewhere? Should you not buy it? That's a question I'd want to know. And the answer is don't panic. The thing is, um, the, the parent company, 
Forest River, Keystone, Jayco, Thor, whatever, they're the ones that really provide the warranty. It's not like just the, the, the brand name providing the warranty. So you still have your parent company warranty on those products. As long as they're new in stock, they get registered, you will have your warranty on those. Now, if you see one of those, like if you're like, hey, I like it, I wanna put a ring on it, do it, go camping, have a good time. RV brands, floor plans, they come and go all the time. People don't realize that, they come and go all the time. This feels like something different, but it's really not. It's just there's a lot of it happening all at once. Instead of maybe one here or there, there's just kind of a sudden wave of it. Um, but I think it's enough that you it will affect what certain dealers stock, what certain dealers carry. You may see uh, old brands that have been at a place for a while go away and some new brands come in to replace them, which I don't know that I necessarily dislike. Sometimes it's nice to kind of shake things up a little bit and we'll see how it all pans out. But again, I, I, I've said it 20 times, I'll say it 21 or 37 or whatever it takes. Please verify any of this if any of it gives you any concern and what if you've heard something that confirms or to the contrary please leave comments in this video and i can help keep a rolling log of things like that and there was some legislation that i first caught wind of last month uh that was like going under review that uh nearly completely changed how the dollars and cents dealings and interactions you have with an rv dealer a golf cart even a whole bunch of things were happening so there's this legislation basically known as cars um combating auto retail scams the the point of this was to try to prevent the practice of junk fees from being so freaking rampant out there. And uh, junk fees are things where like, so you have your sale price, and then there's a bunch of other hidden things packed onto it before you realize what the final total is and you're kind of told, to, they're not really well disclosed kind of things. Um, uh, in, in the world of automotive sales, uh, th this legislation went through. Exemptions were made for things like, um, you know, motorhomes, towable RVs, again, golf carts, motorcycles, ATVs, a bunch of things like that. The reasoning at this time, and I got mixed emotions on this. I don't know that I'm super happy about it, and it is something that's uh, long-term still under review and may change eventually, but for now, basically, um, the, the reasoning was uh, these other recreational things uh, that are being exempt from cars, they are, they're different because they have different needs, different people have different needs. So like you can't reasonably predict a battery. We used to include batteries for, for everybody, but um, some RVs come with basic batteries. Some RVs come with nice batteries. Some people don't need nice batteries. Some people won't go without nice batteries. And that could be the difference of an extra thousand or two dollars on your purchase. And we can't reasonably predict what everyone needs or, or wants anymore like we used to be able to, you know. So because of the way that those things can vary, different hitching, etc. Um, for now, the RV industry has largely, uh, dealers specifically, not the industry, but RV dealers have been exempt from this. And again, I'll tell you, I got mixed emotions about it. I, uh, be, because I think that there's still a way that a person could have a, you know, a, a menu or a parts department where they get to choose their own battery. But the, the practice of just redonkulous hidden fees is out there all the time. I'm not going to get into where this came from, but I want you to take a look at this over here. If we go through and we dissect this, what is listed as an $18,995 RV, um, you, you go through and it has, okay, it has a discount. And that discount seems reasonable if they didn't have fees piled on top of it. So it's a normal discount, but then you immediately see things like uh, a, a, like a whole bunch of shipping fee dollars and uh, a, a hitch for an RV that costs that does not need a big, super expensive hitch. That's a very expensive hitch for a little thing. So I guess there's money to be made there. And I don't, I don't fault a dealership for making money. That's what we do. That's not a secret. Anybody who acts otherwise, they're liars. That's stupid. Um, you know, we're, we're not UNICEF as it were, but there's a right way and a wrong way to do it, I feel. Um, then again, I'll probably never make the most money because of those beliefs. So neither here nor there. Uh, it, then you start looking down, you see like prep fee, not included in the, the base price of this RV, even though it had, uh, you know, a modest discount, they're still hitting you for prep fee. Then we go down, the one that really blows me away is processing fee. Nobody can tell me what that is. It's like almost another $800. Um, it reminds me of uh, uh, any anyone who was around the auto industry when that was still like the Wild West. Remember a thing called ADP? 
you'd see ADP on a purchase agreement. That stood for additional dealer profit, and you, you can't just do that anymore. Uh, but apparently, you can just rename it and go back to business is, is the best that I can figure this is happening. Now, if you look all the way at the bottom, you look like, okay, well, I'm not financing MSRP, but look really closely right above that. That is after you put down $2,000 of your own money. So you're actually paying over MSRP for this thing, but none of that is ever disclosed clearly to you unless you really know how to read this. It's just not simple. The average, this was sent to me by uh, a consumer who's like, uh, what am I looking at here? Like these numbers are very confusing and then they're telling me I should just sign today. Um, you know, uh, whether you sign or not, that's up to you. You, I think you deserve to know what you're signing and what you're getting for those dollars, you know. Another thing, I, I'm, I'm way off topic here, but another thing that this would help, uh, even though there's already technically legislation for this in there, it's still a rampant practice. If you're financing an RV, which most people are, if it is even suggested that the lender would not complete the lending unless you add an extended warranty, or some BS membership program, or like gap insurance. The lender will not, cannot require that of you. And if the person you're talking to suggests it, that is a major violation of truth and lending laws. But the fact is, it's still a thing that happens all the time. But there's a lot of places where that is SOP standard operating procedure. And I think that SOP is just a big load of BS. So I think I already know the answer to this, but what? What would you folks, after everything I just shared, what would you say uh, to you know RV dealerships currently being exempt from that? Like I said, I I have I have mixed feelings about it, and what I mean by that is um, it's not something that we do here, and the extra oversight, the extra steps, things you have to prove end up costing extra dollars, and you, the consumer, end up footing that bill. That's the thing that I don't like about it. But the fact is, if we don't do it, then a lot of people end up footing a lot of extra bill they shouldn't have to. But moving on from there, um, it's currently uh, freezing rain season here. The weather just decided to take a crap on me. Um, but speaking of seasons, show season's here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, show season's officially here, and show season is often used as a barometer for what the, uh, the industry is going to look like for uh, kind of the year. Um, and um, it's been kind of hit or miss, you know? Um, there have been uh, cases where, so like the Tampa, big Tampa show wrapped up recently, and I talked to a bunch of the RV manufacturing people I know down there, a couple dealer people, and it sounds like it was really hit or miss. Like um, the uh, Alliance did very well. Like I heard that uh, Alliance was very popular out there, and I'm slipping on the ice again. Um, but I heard a couple other, you know, uh, big name brands had a much softer year. I heard like the guys at Brinkley tore it up, but not everyone was as successful. And it, the trend that I'm noticing is the brands that are known for having better back-end customer support, they're the ones that really seem to be doing very well. Um, the Quartzite, uh, interesting thing with Tampa, their their ticket pre-sales were double what they were last year. And everyone's like, whoa, this is going to be big. And maybe it would have been, they had about the worst weather that Tampa could have had short of a hurricane for that event. So all in all, I guess it wasn't bad, but because the weather, it's kind of a, still a bit of a question mark. Quartzite, I guess, just had really, really big attendance and was a very popular thing. I think Quartzite gets overshadowed by Tampa going on, but Quartzite is another one of those big barometer kind of shows, especially, you know, kind of on the western side of the country. Uh, what, what's the market going to look like over there? Now, I've personally been at a couple shows. I had the awesome pleasure of getting to meet some of you there, and I'll try to keep putting out what I'm going to be at various events. Um, uh, when this comes out, as it comes out, I'll be at the Novi RV Expo. After that, I'm not sure if I'll be down in Indianapolis at one of our things or out in Omaha. I, I, I wish I could be everywhere for our team and meet you, but I can't. But what I've seen has been very interesting. Um, we, uh, attendance at every event that I've been at personally has been down, but our sales have been up about 30% at those events. So... Uh, thank you everyone who, you know, made the choice to choose our doorstep. Um, it's, it's just been a very, very interesting year. And it really kind of so far has aligned with a lot of the projections that are out there where, um, there's a lot of thought that says, uh, the first quarter this year is going to be a little rocky. The second quarter is going to kind of smooth out. And then, uh, depending on what happens later in the year, it's kind of projected that things may recover and, and shift up a little bit 
but there's still plenty of time before we get there. Who knows what'll happen? I don't know. Where do you think the industry is going to go later this year? Like up, down, in between? Uh, it remains to be seen. And one of the factors that may influence that heavily are fuel prices, because naturally, this is a very mobile-based industry, and if you want to move stuff around, you take some kind of fuel to make that happen, typically. Um, the way that it's looking like through the holidays, we largely saw a little bit of a dip in fuel prices. Um, it doesn't look like we're going to see a massive drop in fuel prices, but through winter, um, I don't know if we're going to hit a national average of $3 per gallon. I think we're going to get tantalizingly close, then come up just short. Then through summer, it's kind of projected that fuel prices are going to creep up close to $4 per gallon, but not quite get there. Now that is a national average figure. So like where I live is almost exactly dead on the national average most of the time. We're typically slightly below, but uh, folks out west, they tend to get get it pretty painfully hard it is kind of projected that in uh, a lot of our western states may expect at times fuel prices to be 50 percent higher than national average which just really sucks pretty hard obviously and i i always like to ask the question when i hear stuff like this coming into the year because again everything i just shared is not necessarily awesome information to make you want to go out and buy a camper that's not what a lot of these industry updates are they're helping you decide whether you do or don't you know um and again you appreciate the tr uh, transparency the candor uh especially on like that whole manufacturing segment that's scary to talk about hit that subscribe button tell me a quick thanks or something like that smash the like button because you know it's youtube and you, you gotta i don't know over dramatize everything um but uh how are fuel prices gonna affect your travel plans are you gonna just like hey i'm gonna go anyway like it's, I guess maybe I'm in a position where I can do this, but like I'll make more money later. I want to spend time and money with my kid now while she's young and we can make those memories, but not, maybe not everyone has that luxury, you know, being fair about it. Um, you know, are, are you just going to stay closer to home? Or are you just going to be like, well, I don't know, maybe not this year, Martha. Leave me a note, let me know. And while you're leaving notes for the class, some good news. Campground congestion is something, that's a topic that has been broached on this channel multiple times, especially in these industry updates, and it's appeared in my comment section quite a bit. Um, we uh, may be seeing a, a pretty nice chunk of relief uh, over the next three years. Um, it's, it's definitely regionally, but uh, now through 2027, it is projected that 18,115 new campsites are going to be made. And that represents, um, uh, like, the vast majority of that, uh, over 13,000 of those sites are coming in the form of, like, 66 new facilities totally new campgrounds and then just a bunch of extra sites being added to existing campgrounds now on top of that um i've heard a lot of expansion of cabin rentals or some places actually just have a pad and a trailer that you just get to rent it's not necessarily a cabin but basically the same thing but more sites more places um there's i've also heard that there's uh more projects in the works but nothing that people are willing to talk about publicly quite yet effectively um what's interesting about this is um i ask people you know how far out do you have to book to actually get reservations at places and i hear people saying six to nine months at a lot of popular places very consistently and i'd encourage you to share on this video like how often do you or how far out do you have to book here's the interesting thing about that when i actually talk to people who get to those campgrounds if i talk to people who travel and they can't make six months ahead of time uh you know reservations what i often hear is they get there and the, the campgrounds at maybe 60% capacity, even though they were totally booked up way ahead of time. Well, um, what uh, the, the general consensus here is that there are a combination of factors relating to like third party sites that like they'll, they'll book up all the reservations they can at a campground and then they resell those. And if it's a couple days out and they haven't sold them yet, they just cancel them. Or some people will like, because they don't know what the weather's gonna be like. And I mean, I, I get that, but they will uh, book up like a two or three week window. And then looking at the weather forecast, decide which weekend or week or whatever they wanna go to, and then just abandon the rest. And as a result, that leaves a lot of open availability so that people who are traveling around generally are still finding that they can camp with a lot of spontaneity. Um, I know people that have traveled from coast to coast for work, never knowing where they're going next. And they've told me, I've never had a problem finding a place to sleep. So uh, there's kind of a tale of two cities there. Those who like to really book ahead, like my wife, they are, um, you know, they don't like the current environment. 
uh, people who are a little more off the cuff, like yours truly, um, where it's like, well, if they're booked up, I'll find another place tonight. And if nothing else, I, I've got a roof over my head like I'm good. They're doing just fine, you know, so it's kind of a tale of two cities there. Uh, but again, I would still be kind of curious to know, like, what have you seen? What have you heard around your neck of the woods uh, when you're making plans? Or if you're traveling um, spontaneously, are you still able to find places to park? Something uh, I, I am excited about, and I've, I've talked about this on camera before, uh, we're, we're seeing more and more safety features, specifically towing safety features, come into the RV industry. Stuff that feels like it probably, to me, it feels like it should have been done and required a long time ago, but hasn't been yet. I think a lot of that is just due to the fact that the RV industry overall has been so much smaller than things like the RV industry. We haven't seen a big mandate on towing safety stuff, but I feel like we're kind of moving that direction, um, which means more expensive things, but better, safer things too. So to me, that's juice that's worth the squeeze. Um, I'm never going to replace my wife and kid. Um, you know, I want to keep them safe. So what I'm getting at here is like last year, um, well, well, like analog brakes, uh, Tucson and some other uh, manufacturers have offered an aftermarket, um, uh, analog brake system for a while. Then like last year, uh, Lippert partnered up with Grand Design and they released like one of the first mainstream market uh, ABS systems out there. And like ABS is something I think since like 1997 or eight has been required on semi-tractor trailers. And I, and, uh, I, I believe um, even though the entire automotive industry was at like 90% compliance, September of 2011, I think is when the auto industry was uh, mandated to go to 100% ABS in all new vehicles they built by uh, the National Highway Transit Safety, NHSTA Safety Transit Authority. I don't know, whatever. Those, that alphabet soup, they were required to do that. Um, the RV industry doesn't mandate anything like that. Uh, but more and more manufacturers are jumping on board. Like recently um, down at Tampa, uh, Lippert put on a big display of their ABS system, partnered up with Keystone Cougar, who now has it on every single thing. They have it on, they're the first brand I've seen from top to bottom that have ABS from their smallest trailer to their biggest fifth wheel. And that means a lot to me. You know, that's, that's reason number 37. I tend to be a little bit of a Cougar fanboy, maybe more than I should be, but they're a brand they like. And they're certainly not perfect like anything else, but what is, but whatever. But then after Lippert came out, Dexter Tow Assist came out and we're seeing this on more and more and more products. We're also seeing things like, in addition to just like side and rear view cameras like we've seen before, like Ember RV has, I call it throwing radar out its butt. It has blind spot detection radar built onto every one of their touring edition uh, travel trailers. And it works like an absolute champ. Um, I, I hope that we continue to see more and more of that. Um, the, uh, the, the other thing that I heard recently in terms of just general consumer safety, but maybe kind of also um, towing safety, is that uh, NHSTA also recently basically hit the, the, the trigger button um, saying that by 2027, um, uh, 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 emergency braking assist or something like that, where like your vehicle just detects that the car in front of you is going significantly slower than you and you're about to smash into them and it fires your brakes for you, that that will be mandatory on all uh, cars and um, light duty trucks under 10,000 pounds by 2027. That being said, currently uh, the auto industry is already in 90% compliance with that. So hats off to the auto industry. I'm, I'm hopeful the RV industry continues to, uh, to keep up with that sort of stuff, but that's, that's me. Maybe I got my head in the clouds a little bit on this. As consumers, what would you like to see? Would you like to see mandatory ABS on trailers or anything like that? Or do you not want to have to pay the extra money? Would you just rather send it as she is? And wrapping up our news this year, it's something that many of you in certain parts of the country will literally hear about, and that is Cicada Gaddon. Um, if you're, if you're not familiar, cicadas are these fun little bugs that just burrow underground and they sit dormant for periods of time. And it's interesting, there's different broods of cicadas that all activate basically at, at, on different intervals. Um, they're two of the biggest broods. One activates every 13 years, one activates every 17, and they are both about to hit. Every 221 years, 
this happens where they basically align. The last time it happened, I think if I'm doing their math right, would be 1803. I don't know who was in office at the time back then because I'm not that good at history. Um, because, you know, I'm an American. Um, <laughs> As I like to remind all my Canadian friends, they're like, hey, you remember when? I'm like, no, I, I don't, we don't learn our own history that well up here, down here, whatever. Anyway, um, these things are going to come out and they are going to spend, thankfully, only about uh, two weeks. They're going to come out. They're going to start screaming at one another, looking for a mate. They're going to eat all the things. They're going to reproduce and they're going to die. And they're going to go back into the ground after that. So, uh, you know, there, there's going to be some areas of the country. I, I got, We're going to see some Facebook videos where people can't sleep in a hybrid camper because it's just so screaming loud up there. Now, on a positive note, in a bit I like to call turning chicken poop into chicken soup. Um, apparently, in the culinary world, cicadas are known for having a nutty, shrimp-like uh, flavor and texture which is not a thing I knew until today, and now you know as well. So evidently, if you wanted to have, <laughs> those things are big. If you want to pop some cicada pizza rolls, uh, apparently a little paprika and butter fries them right up. I don't know. And in an unrelated note, screened in tent room sales just went up 37%. Imagine that. Hold on, I gotta go tell my parts department to stock up on those. And as always, thanks again for tuning in. And a quick special thanks to the Nerd Herd. Thank you all so much for all the time you spent tuning in here. Listen to me blather on. If you found value in this, if this was beneficial, maybe at least just a little entertaining, hit that like button, share it. Maybe share our video into like your favorite Facebook group or, or, well, it's not Twitter now, X. What's it called? It's not called tweeting. Is it called Xing? That's stupid. Anyway, um... <laughs> Of course, what do I know? He's the bajillionaire who goes into rocket space with a convertible or whatever. My point here is if you appreciate what we're doing, let us know. And I'll continue to try to do my best to put it out there, even when it's hard to share, even when it's not beneficial necessarily directly to us, but beneficial to you, even when it's scary. We will continue to make it happen. So until next time, thanks again for tuning in. Take care, stay safe, have fun, and best wishes from Bishes, everyone. Ugh, I am soaked and freezing.